Welcome back, and we hope you enjoyed the break, and thank you for staying tuned. It's now my honor to introduce our final speaker today, the 20th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the nation's highest ranking military officer and principal advisor to the President, the Secretary of Defense, and the National Security Council, General Mark A. Milley, U.S. Army. Prior to becoming Chairman in October 2019, General Milley served as the 39th Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. A native of Massachusetts, General Milley graduated from Princeton University in 1980, where he received his commission from Army ROTC. General Milley has had multiple commands and staff positions in eight divisions and special forces throughout the last 39 years. These positions include command of the 1st Battalion, 506th Infantry, 2nd Infantry Division, 2nd Brigade, 10th Mountain Division, Deputy Commanding General, 101st Division, Commanding General of the 10th Mountain Division, Commanding General 3 Corps, and Commanding General of the U.S. Army Forces Command. Before we hand it over to General Milley, we want to remind you to use the Q&A engagement tool on your screen to submit your questions, and we will address as many as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I speak for all of us when I say we're thrilled to have General Milley with us here today. Welcome, General Milley. Good morning, and over to you, sir. Hey, Peter, thank, thank you uh, for that introduction, and, and uh, I want to uh, just right off the bat say how uh, honored and humbled I am to be, have an opportunity here to speak at the Naval Institute, and thanks for your leadership. Uh, also, for the audience, you may or may not know, uh, but Peter is a card-carrying member of the Red Sox Nation. Uh, he says uh, on the surface that he's a supporter of the Cubs, but that's not actually true. Uh, he's a graduate of Holy Cross, and his family going back to his grandfather it's a graduate of Holy Cross. So he has the Red Sox Nation in his blood. So thanks, Peter, not only for being a great naval officer and a great naval leader, uh, but also for your loyalty uh, to the Holy Land of uh, Massachusetts. So thank you, Peter. Um, I also want to, I, I, I didn't get a chance to see the full um, suite of panels and so on, but I do want to give a little shout out. I don't know if they're on the net or not, but a shout out uh, to the CNO, Admiral Gilday, and uh, to the CMC, General Berger. Both are uh, great officers uh, and and everyone in the audience, those in, in the Navy or supporters of the Navy, which I'm assuming most are, uh, should know that you have two uh, great officers uh, that are leading our Naval service, and, and they are tremendous advocates for all things Navy, uh, all things Marines uh, here in D.C., and, and I personally appreciate not only their friendship, but their professional uh, support. I did see in the program uh, Bob Wart. Uh, of course, he was the former DepSec Def, um, and I had an opportunity uh, to work with him for several years uh, in that capacity. Uh, and, and I will tell you that uh, I don't know if he's on or not either, uh, but for anyone out in the audience, uh, everyone would do well to uh, Google him and his writings that he's had over the years. Uh, he's a brilliant mind. Uh, he's a, a person who clearly thinks uh, very deeply about the nature of war, the character of war, uh, the future of our military and cares deeply about the defense of our nation. So uh, I would commend anything that uh, has the byline Bob work to it uh, for, for some serious study, uh, which uh, leads me uh, to really uh, why we're here and what I want to talk about, which is uh, uh, the future uh, of uh, warfare and how I think at least the Navy and the Marines uh, uh, fit into that. Uh, I do want to uh, mention that uh, although I'm wearing an Army uniform. Uh, as a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, this uniform might as well be colored purple. Uh, and I am joint. And I am very proud uh, to be a graduate of the Naval War College. And I'm even more proud uh, that both my mother and my father were in the Navy during World War II. Both are passed on, but my mother uh, served at a hospital in Seattle, taking care of the wounded coming back from the Pacific. And my dad was a Navy corpsman who served with the 4th Marine Division and did the assault landings at uh, Kawajalin, Saipan, Tinian, and Iwo Jima. Uh, so very, very proud of their service, uh, very proud of our Navy. And I will tell you that we as a nation are incredibly lucky <clears throat> to have uh, the United States Navy. Uh, it is far and away uh, the greatest Navy in the history of the world. Uh, it is far and away the dominant naval force uh, for at least 70 years, since 1945 uh, and beyond. Uh, so I would tell you that our country uh, as a native of the, the greater Boston area, uh, this was uh, uh, really drilled into me at a young age. 
uh, with many, many trips to the USS Constitution in Boston Harbor. Um, we are a maritime nation. We always have been uh, in, in so many ways. And our prosperity, our freedom, uh, our commerce, our way of life in so many ways is dependent upon uh, free and open seas, freedom of navigation, uh, and, and it's uh, very dependent uh, on the free commerce uh, across the world uh, by sea. Uh, just a couple of factoids that I, I think most people in the audience are probably aware of. Uh, one is that 90% of all goods and trade internationally is still carried by sea. Uh, that's an important fact. Um, and uh, there are a variety of choke points, as those who went to the Naval War College fully know, as you lay out the maps and the sea lines of communications, et cetera. But having the global commons of the sea uh, that is free and open is so fundamental, not only to the United States, uh, but to the entire world, as 90% of all trade uh, goes uh, by the ocean. For the United States, we've got more or less uh, a $20 trillion uh, economy, a $20 trillion GDP. About uh, almost $6 trillion of that is dependent upon commerce that comes in and out uh, by sea. 95% uh, of all international communications goes by sea. So for the United States, if we're going to consider ourselves a great power, if we're going to consider ourselves a significant uh, 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 power in the world, that arbitrates the rules of the road, if that's going to be our mission, and it has been like that for uh, going on 75 years now, uh, then having a naval force that is capable of maintaining and sustaining a free and open global commons of the sea is fundamental to not only our freedom, but the freedom of uh, many other uh, parts uh, of the world. Uh, I would also tell you uh, that to do that, uh, we have a Navy that uh, is not only uh, excellent and great in so many ways uh, for the last seven and a half decades, but it has been dominant. Uh, so if you were to look at the U.S. Navy, and I don't know, pick your year, 1850, 1870, something like that, uh, it was the British Navy uh, that ruled the waves, so to speak. But from 1945 to today, the United States Navy has no peer, uh, and that has been true. Uh, for, for that entire period of time, there's been no one who has been able to successfully challenge the United States Navy at sea. I could say the same thing in many ways about air power. Uh, most militaries around the world have very capable armies, and I'm an army officer. They have very capable armies. They have infantry and armor and so on. And uh, we have, in my mind, the, the greatest army in the world, and we have the greatest Marine Corps. But land power has a, has a finite uh, limit to our capabilities. But it's air power, it is sea power, and it's our ability to project power that makes us so over the last uh, seven and a half uh, decades or so. So now that's kind of where we're at. And if you roll the clock uh, forward a little bit, uh, where are we going? Um, and, and this is a big open question. And we may not get it right. In fact, I would almost guarantee that we're not going to get it right. Uh, but in the words of, uh, of, of uh, Professor Howard, Michael Howard, a, a great military historian, he said, it's not a matter of getting it right. It's a matter of getting it less wrong than your opponent. So as we look to the future, and, and, and looking to the future is always a difficult task. An economist would tell you anything outside of two or three years is sort of a fool's errand to, to really look at any significant investment opportunities. Uh, other people, I've heard many people in, in, in our world, in the national security world, say anything beyond a five, to five to seven years is something that's not uh, really predictable. And, and I suppose in a true sense, in a detailed sense, that's true. Uh, but... Uh, we, unfortunately, don't have that luxury. We have to, in the business we're in, we have to be able to project out uh, at distance. We have to be able to project out uh, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and at least make estimates as best we can to frame what we think uh, is likely to happen so that we should develop our doctrines, our organizations, our acquisition programs, our weapon systems, et cetera, uh, to give us a decisive advantage in the future. 
So what does that mean for right now? I would argue that today we are in the middle of a fundamental uh, change in the character of war. Uh, and I, the nature of war uh, doesn't change very often, at least as long as human beings are involved in it. And it's the Klaus Witzian principles of war and uh, where, he, where he talks about uh, friction and fog and all of that. The, the nature of war is probably not going to change. But the character of war does change, and it changes frequently. Oftentimes, technology is a, is a driver of the character of war. Uh, sometimes you'll see demographic changes or, or other societal changes, political changes, et cetera, that drive the character of war. Uh, and in many cases, it's a combination of all of those. And think back uh, in history a little bit to get a sense for what I'm talking about. A technological change, for example, uh, that made significant uh, impact militarily was when someone decided to put lands and grooves inside a metal tube and change a musket to a rifle. Well, that changed the, the distance at which a ball could be uh, fired with some accuracy. And yet most people didn't quite realize the, the impact, the effect that that was going to have uh, until uh, really the Civil War and beyond, where we enter the Civil War, the American Civil War, shoulder to shoulder and ground tactics. Uh, and then uh, we get introduced to rifled uh, muskets uh, and we find that instead of 100 yards of accuracy, uh, we can shoot and kill out to two, three, and 400 yards. That then causes a change in the ground tactics, along with other introductory weapon systems and technological changes during the Civil War. All of those things took great uh, emphasis and, and a great amount of technological advancement from, call it the American Civil War, out through, call it World War I, out through the early part of the the last century. Those people who were like me and they were wearing four stars at the time, they didn't quite grasp all the technological changes that had occurred. They didn't quite grasp the impact. So they enter World War I thinking cavalry charges on horseback or close order charges shoulder to shoulder were still a really smart thing to do when now you have machine guns and barbed wire and proximate fuse artillery and so on and so forth. You also see at the tail end of that war, the introduction of aviation. Uh, you see the introduction of wireless communications, very limited amounts, but you see, start seeing the introduction. So between World Wars I and World War II, and everyone's familiar with the story, you have one of the greatest fundamental changes in the character of war ever recorded. With the introduction of aviation, uh, the introduction of wireless communications, or radio, the introduction of mechanization, uh, the introduction of things like radar, and there's about 10 or 15 other uh, technologies that are out there. It had fundamental changes to the character of war. It had obvious impact on ground warfare with the introduction of combined arms formations and the tank and so on. It has obvious impact to naval warfare uh, with the introduction of the carrier, for example, where we shift from uh, battleship as the main, uh, main uh, focus of fighting pre-World War II, and the carrier then becomes uh, the weapon of choice in the Pacific and elsewhere uh, for World War II and beyond. Uh, you see uh, other changes throughout history where you go from uh, sail to steam uh, or, or coal-powered uh, ships. You see going from wood to steel. There's fundamental changes that have occurred throughout history in the character of war, but they only occur really once in a while. We are in one of those once in a whiles right now as we speak. And I would say that Typically speaking, a change in the character of war more or less unfolds. It takes usually about, at least my analysis tells me, that it takes somewhere between 25 and 50 to 75 years to unfold. And we're in the middle of one of those. I, I would say that we're probably, my guess is we're in about uh, year 30 or so of this fundamental change in the character of war. And you could date it even further back than that. Take the 1970s as an example. Right at the tail end of the Vietnam War, we see the introduction of precision munitions, where we're bombing certain uh, bridges, for example, in North Vietnam with precision. Most countries, in fact, no other country except us, had precision munitions at that moment in time. And then other countries start proliferating those weapons. Uh, and so today, most countries, most advanced countries, have precision munitions. Also, you see a proliferation of advanced communications. 1973 is your first email. Think about that. 
So I'm in whatever it was, freshman or sophomore in high school. Uh, and that's your first email. In uh, 1991, uh, 20 years later or so, uh, you get your first website. 2008, another 20 years or so, you see the introduction with Steve Jobs of the iPhone. We've had an unbelievable proliferation of information technologies. It's beyond anything that's ever happened in human history. And the impacts uh, are yet to be fully felt. Think what the impact of the Gutenberg Press was on the diffusion of information. Most everybody was illiterate prior to the Gutenberg Press, except some monks. Once the Gutenberg Press came around and they started translating uh, into local languages, uh, from Greek or Latin into local languages, you had this diffusion of knowledge. And then you started having this diffusion of power, political power, which led then to a whole series of political things, which ultimately culminated in our own uh, U.S. Uh, revolution uh, and then the French Revolution and so on. The whole set of social movements were unleashed. That is happening today in the information world. With information, the diffusion of power uh, amongst people, you see the Arab Spring, for example, and the speed at which uh, mass communications can transmit ideas, either good or bad. It's, it's a neutral thing. It's not judgmental, but it gets information out there very rapidly, very fast. And that's just in the commercial sector. If you look at our ability to sense based on those information technologies, our ability to sense is unbelievable. Uh, we can see the world today as if you could never see it before at any point in history. Between the domains of space and cyber, uh, we can reach out and we can track, see, identify, and then if you can see it, and now we have long-range precision munitions, you can hit it. This is fundamental, and this has a huge impact on the future of combat, in regardless of what domain you're in. Just those two things. Add to that some emerging technologies that are rapidly coming at us in both the commercial world uh, and will absolutely have impact uh, on military operations in the future. Let's take robotics. Uh, robotics today are being widely experimented with in the commercial world. You're seeing companies like Amazon having, having little quadcopters deliver pizza or whatever they're delivering. You've got Budweiser running trucks up and down the highways and byways of California delivering beer and so on. So most militaries absolutely are going to maximal, uh, maximize the use of robots at some point in the future. That point is rapidly coming, and I would peg it at maybe 10 to 15 years max. You're going to see the widespread, ubiquitous use of robots throughout most militaries in the world. Combine that with the most advanced form of information technologies that are coming at us very rapidly, which is artificial intelligence. If you put artificial intelligence and you do man-machine teaming, uh, add that to robotics, put in precision munitions and the ability to sense and see, throw in a few hypersonic weapons, and you've got, in addition to about 10 or 15 other technologies, you've got a fundamental shift in how we are going to have to fight and come to grips with. And I don't have, and nor does anybody, by the way, have all the answers. Uh, but we as a military, we as a joint force, are going to have to uh, experiment and explore on a really a, a campaign of learning to determine exactly what the impacts of this change in the character of war is going to be. But I do know that it's fundamental and it's going to be significant. And I would argue that it will likely be decisive in the conduct of war. Let me shift gears from the tech piece. There's also some fundamental changes in the geostrategic environment uh, that is undeniable and that is going to fundamentally impact, uh, if not how we fight, certainly who we fight and where we fight. And one of those is the economic transformation of China since the Deng Xiaoping reforms of 1979. China has uh, gone on a uh, economic growth pattern of nearly 10% uh, up until, I guess, uh, five, six, seven years ago, where they slowed down to about 5 or 6% economic growth a year in, year out. That's huge. That's the biggest economic growth of any nation uh, that I know of in that compressed period of time, 40, 41 years uh, in the history of the world. That's huge. A billion people were lifted out of poverty. So what does that mean? Most countries historically that had that level of economic growth have always developed a military. 
and a very, very powerful military. And that's exactly what we've seen with China. China is developing, and I don't need to tell this audience or anybody else, they are developing an exceptionally strong military that is going to be capable in space and cyber, uh, on the sea, land and air, and so on. Very, very capable. They're moving out. They have a very deliberate plan. They have a vision of the future. It's a very, uh, it's, it's very calibrated, and they know uh, the interim objectives that they're trying to meet, et cetera. Their intent, according to public documents, and I believe these public documents, uh, their intent is to essentially uh, match the United States military's uh, capability and capacity uh, by, call it the mid-30-ish time frame, 2035, something in that, in that range. And they would like to uh, at least not only match us, uh, but exceed us, to dominate us, to be able to beat us in armed conflict by mid-century. Now, that's a big statement. Uh, if that, in fact, proves true, uh, then that is an uh, ungood geopolitical situation uh, for the United States of America. So uh, there's other geopolitical changes that have occurred. Uh, Russia, North Korea, Iran, uh, terrorists, uh, lots of other things have happened and, and will continue to happen. But that one on China is undeniable, uh, and it is something that we, the United States, are going to have to come to grips with. It is pointed out in the NDS, uh, and it is without question the singular uh, national security challenge in terms of nation states that we're going to face. Other things that are changing that, are, that will impact our future. As I mentioned, uh, China is a rise of China, and I mentioned Russia, North Korea, and, and Iran. But there is clearly an increase in the diffusion of power. So we're entering into a world, and arguably we've been in it for quite some time, of a multipolar world where there are multiple powers regionally and in globally uh, that are going to impact us. Much different than the Cold War. We had two fundamental geopolitical powers, the United States and Soviet Union. So a multipolar world is also an environment that we're going to be operating in. I would tell you that uh, things like climate change and other environmental factors are going to impact the conduct of military operation and national security. We may or may not, as a military, be able to have any impact on the climate, but the climate is going to impact us for sure. Uh, there will be crises associated with food and water uh, and floods and all kinds of uh, uh, severe uh, climatic changes that are going to occur in the out years. They're all going to impact us in one way or another. There's some significant demographic changes that are occurring. Uh, specifically urbanization. By mid-century, more or less 80% or so of the global population, which is estimated to be at that point uh, probably in the 8 to maybe 9 billion range, is likely to be in highly dense urban areas. That will have a significant impact on the conduct of military operations uh, as well. Uh, and then lastly, I would say the one that is obvious about some changes, because we're living through it right now, COVID-19 or global pandemics. We are likely to see global pandemics at some point in the future, not just this one, but others of different varieties. Uh, and that is something that we're gathering a lot of lessons learned that as a military, we're going to have to come to grips with because it too will have significant military effect. So what does all that mean? Uh, that means there's great stress on this international order that was developed uh, at the end of World War II that has been in existence for seven and a half decades that the United States Navy, perhaps more than any other uh, element in the system has preserved that international rule-based order, and that order is under tremendous stress. It's under stress from geopolitical changes, climatic changes, pandemic changes, and the changing character of war, economic changes, and, and many, many other changes are happening. That order, if that order falls apart, then great power competition could, I'm not saying it will, but it could turn into great power war. So it's our task to make sure that doesn't happen. We want to sustain and maintain great power peace. Keep it at great power competition. Don't get to great power war. And so how do you do that? Well, there's no guarantee to anything for in the future, but we do have good guideposts uh, from the past. And one of those is to have a military that is extraordinarily capable in terms of our knowledge, our skills, our attributes, our people, our equipment, and have it so competent, so capable, that it is, it, the words like overmatch and dominant don't even begin to describe it. You want your opponent to know unequivocally that if they get in a fight with the United States of America, 
hands down, they will lose, and they will lose a very large way, very swiftly, and in a very catastrophic way to their national interests. That's important. Uh, if we do that, then it is less likely that we will get in a war. The proposition there is that if we maintain a high degree of military capability and we have a demonstrated will to use it and the opponent knows it, then that is the essence of deterrence. And so the key here is to stay at great power competition, maintain the great power peace, and the way to do that is through assuring deterrence and having a very capable military. How does that apply uh, to specifically uh, to the Navy? I would argue that all those changes that I mentioned are going to place great emphasis on a couple of uh, key things that I would argue that uh, our military is going to have to uh, adapt to over time as we uh, move to the next 10 to 15 to 20 years or so. One of them is our military is going to have to survive. Uh, and you're not going to survive in large organizations. Uh, smaller will be better in the future. S a, a small force that is nearly invisible and undetectable, that's in a constant state of movement, and it's widely distributed, that will be a force that's survivable. So you're not going to accomplish any objective if you're dead. So rule one is you got to survive. So smaller forces, widely distributed, that are very difficult to detect, will be key to a future military, a key to the success of a future military, in my view. Secondly, is that smaller, widely distributed force has got to be highly lethal. Um, so it can't just be running around, you know, with muskets and, and, and rifles sort of thing. It's got to be a highly lethal force and take advantage of all the different weapon systems that are out there at range, precision, and so on. So a highly lethal force, a widely distributed force that survives. And in order for that, to be lethal, that force is going to have to be connected because none of these forces are going to be able to be totally lethal in and of themselves. Some will, but most will not. They're going to have to be connected to other forces <clears throat> that you can bring in other types of systems and other types of fires. It just sort of makes sense. So the network, the communications network, that information technology network, that too is going to have to be survivable. It's going to have to be redundant. And it's going to have to, and we, uh, the users of that system, are going to have to learn to operate in a degraded network system. And I would say the last piece, uh, the attribute that's going to be fundamental and key to a future military uh, is all of these forces are going to have to be, they're going to have to assume that they're cut off, that you have contested logistics, that your lines of communications are not secure. And these forces are going to have to be self-sustainable through their logistics systems. Uh, and that's going to be very, very difficult for the United States to adapt to because we are used to uh, lots of comfort items, et cetera, uh, throughout our military history. Uh, and we are used to repair parts and having the best of everything, even on a battlefield. Uh, we're going to have to uh, get very, very uh, good at operating in a much more austere environment, uh, one that has denied all the great logistics that we've had uh, for years and years and years. Uh, those are just some things. It's not a, a, an end-all list. I've got a much longer list. But those are some of the characteristics of future force. So bring it right home to the Navy. And then I'll stop and take some questions. What does it mean to the Navy? So we proposed, uh, we be in the Department of Defense, with a lot of coordination with the great work by the Navy and Marine Corps, uh, with uh, calling it Battle Force 2045. Uh, and, you know, you could call it Battle Force 2040 or Battle Force 2050. The year is not so important, but it's just broadly speaking into the deeper future. We proposed uh, putting out a Navy of about uh, 500 ships. Now, a lot of people kind of eyebrows got raised at that. Say, wait a second, 500 ships. Why 500? That's an uh, arbitrary number. Uh, you can't afford it. The country can't afford that uh, and so on. Uh, the critics may be right in many ways, but that's not... Um, that, that's not the point. The point is that's an aim point. Uh, that's a march objective. That's an aspiration. Because we think that we, the United States, are going to have to have not only highly capable, but we're going to have to have a lot of ships. You're going to have to have a much larger fleet than we have today if we're serious. If we're serious about great power competition and deterring great power war, and you're serious about having dominant capability, dominant capability over something like China or, or some other power that has significant capability. If you're serious about that, 
500 is probably your entrance ticket to a competition like that. So we're going to need a larger fleet. There's no question in my mind. But we also have to look at the capability of that fleet, and we have to look at the composition of that fleet. So that 500 doesn't mean it's fully manned. In fact, we proposed somewhere between, we're not sure the exact numbers yet, but somewhere probably in the range of 140, 150, all the way up to maybe 200 and 250 unmanned ships, sailless ships, robots. And that's uh, on the water and under the water. That's a huge, huge transformation of not only our Navy, but that will be a shocker to the entire world. To have that percentage, 25%, maybe even more, of the fleet is sailless, that's, that's as big a change as going from sail to coal, from going from wood to steel. That's a big deal in the introduction of robotics. Uh, the inter intermediate objective, and the one we want to attain uh, by uh, 2035, is a 355-ship uh, Navy. Now, I would tell you by that time, uh, by the mid-2030s, realistically, probably 60 to 70 percent of the fleet in 15 years is going to look very similar to the fleet we have today. And that is just a, a reality check on the speed at which weapon systems can be developed and, and fielded and tested and so on and so forth. So a good 60 to 70 percent of the fleet that you see today is going to be very similar by 2035. But we will begin, we'll be on a path to that fleet of 2045. The other piece that we need to take a hard look at, and it's been, a, I don't know how many meetings I've been in on the carriers. Um, I do not recommend uh, and would not recommend replacing the fleet carriers, the CVNs that we have 11, unless there was something better to replace it. So I'm one of these, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater yet. Uh, don't get rid of the horse cavalry till you have a tank, but recognize tanks are here and machine guns are here, right? So realize that large platforms are likely to be uh, significant targets in any future conflict with all the A2, AD uh, capabilities that a country like a China has. So do we really want a ship with four or 5,000 uh, U.S. sailors on it uh, at that level of risk? Now, there's all kinds of things we can do that I'm not going to talk about in an open net uh, where we can hide these ships to a certain degree. But still, it becomes problematic. So what the proposal is for the future Navy is we'll stick with the 11 for now uh, until we have something else, which we don't right now. But also we want to explore basically a World War II concept of smaller like Jeep carriers. We know we need naval aviation, uh, but we also know we need to be smaller, more distributed, uh, and, and, and equally lethal. So maybe something like smaller carriers. So we, uh, we got with the CNO and the Navy and a lot of thinking went into it, and we threw out five or six. So maybe we have five or six Jeep carriers, uh, and maybe once those are, uh, uh, are commissioned, they're at sea, they've gone through the trials, and then maybe you think about coming down from 11 to some other number. Oh, not sure yet. Again, campaign of learning, uh, it's an exploration into the future. But we do know we're going to have to do something with the carrier fleet to make it survivable, more distributed, uh, and lesser of a target. We also need to take a hard look at our crew des mix. Arguably, uh, at least since 1945, and certainly even uh, before that and during World War II, the destroyers are the, are, are the backbone of not only our Navy, but any Navy. Uh, they are the workhorse of the Navy. They're, they're the ships that are out there on the, on the picket line. They're protecting the carrier. They're doing all kinds of work all over the world every day, day in and day out, and they have a fundamental role. So we need to take a hard look at them, how many of them can be robots, how many of them can be manned, uh, can you do one that's manned, tied with two or three that are, uh, are unmanned? We don't know. We have to experiment with that. But we have to take a hard look at the Crudez uh, composition. The one that we are very certain that we need to expand uh, very quickly are subs. We know subs are survivable. We know U.S. subs are survivable. The enemy subs are dead men walking. We're going to take them right out, of the, right out of play right off the bat. But our subs are survivable. And we know that, and we need to expand it. So uh, we, look, we looked at a program of probably somewhere at 70, 80, 90, something like that, uh, uh, additional subs in the system uh, as we go forward towards this uh, battle fleet 2045. Will we hit those exact numbers on those exact times? No. 
but it's the idea, it's the concept that this is what America is going to need if we define our role in the world. Uh, so uh, the last thing I'd leave you with on all of that is uh, how we fight. So it's not just a matter of systems and platforms. Um, we have to take a hard look at our concepts of how we fight. Now, there are threads of continuity and as principles of war and so on that will stay immutable for sure. Uh, but doctrines change. And our doctrines, our joint force doctrines and our individual service doctrines, we're going to have to adapt. We're going to have to change, significantly change, and then significantly change our organizations. And then we have to take a hard look at our leader development and our, uh, and our talent management uh, in order to man either the fleet uh, or, or, the, or the regiments in the Marine Corps, or battalions in the Army, or squadrons in the Air Force. All of those things are going to have to be modified, changed, and made adaptable as we move into the future. The side that does that the best, that integrates the technology, changes their leadership, adapts their doctrines uh, to uh, best incorporate all of that in a, in a synergistic way, in a way of war. The side that does that best by the 2030s and 40s, that side is going to win. And, and we want to make sure that that is the United States. And I would argue that if you have developed it to a level where not only you are confident that you will win, but your enemy or your adversary knows you will win, then you'll never have to actually do it. The, the question will never have to be asked or answered, and you will maintain the deterrence and maintain the great power of peace. So uh, uh, thanks, Peter, uh, for allowing me the opportunity. I probably went a little bit longer than I was supposed to, but I appreciate the opportunity to say a few remarks to the, to the Naval Institute uh, folks that are listening. And I'll be happy to, I can stay for another 20, 25 minutes or so, uh, and I can take whatever questions you or anyone else wants to, wants to ask. Thanks very much. General, thank you very much uh, for your remarks. They're great. Um, first question, I, we've received several, but uh, several along the lines of, uh, of training and uh, integration. And uh, you just made the point about the side that develops, that integrates, that adapts best, uh, will ultimately win. And winning a high-end war fight will require a joint force that's uh, not only built on these high-end capabilities, but exercises them together. And you've got a mandate for joint war fighting and training. And the question is, how is the joint force improving its integrated training? And do we have it right? And do we have enough large scale exercises to do that? Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, no, we don't have it right. We're OK. I mean, we're not like broken, uh, but there's plenty of room to improve, in my view. Uh, so first, w w the very first thing we're working on um, is a joint war fighting concept. Now, that's not doctrine. It's a concept. And the next step will be doctrine after that. Uh, but right now, we've taken um, groups of, of Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Space Force uh, officers, along with cyber folks, uh, jammed them into rooms together uh, over the last, uh, I guess, year or two years now. <clears throat> and we're working on developing a concept of war fighting. And then shortly thereafter, after doctrine, that's important, and 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 so the training is important because you're going to have to exercise that concept and that doctrine. Now, before it turns into doctrine, we have to experiment. So, over the next several years, uh, in terms of joint training and exercises, uh, my preference is mostly experimental. Uh, some of it will be um, in order to improve readiness, and some of it is uh, uh, training to uh, exercise existing war plans, for example. But what I'm more interested in is experimental exercises uh, that will produce uh, insights on this path towards 2045, 2050. That'll be important. Uh, we, we don't have all the answers. We, we absolutely do not have them all. We are going to have to experiment, and we, the best experiment is a variety of training exercises using novel concepts where the players are not only free to fail, but they're encouraged to take high risks, uh, and through failure, you learn. Uh, so that's the, that's the general direction of a variety of exercises uh, that we're trying to drive at the joint world. You asked about, do we have enough large scale? Lar the large scale exercises uh, are good. Um, what, what we have is a lot of exercises in the joint world, 
And what we need to do is trim down the amount of exercises and combine, and this is at least my view, this is the guidance I gave the J7, and combine them into more productive exercises that get at very specific training objectives that we need to develop as a joint force. Uh, I, I would, I've said many times in the past, and I'm a very proud Army officer, I got all that, uh, you know, go Army, beat Navy, I got that, you know, all that. But, you know, the Army doesn't go to war, and the Navy doesn't go to war, and the Marines don't go to war, and the Air Force doesn't go to war. None of us go to war uh, as a service. We go to war as a joint force, and, and even more than that, we don't go to war as a military and as a joint force. We go to war as a combined force with allies and partners, which is fundamental to the NBS. And even more than that, we go to war as a nation. So as an interagency, whole of government, you've heard all these terms many, many times before. So our exercises have got to be joint exercises where everyone, it, it's, it's important that a Navy crew go out there and practice Navy drills. It's important a tank crew does their thing and an air crew does their thing. And those are all critical to get the basics down. And probably 70% of your available training time should be at the lower level in order to develop high levels of skills. But a solid 20 to 30% of available training time should be spent at joint and, and combined, allied, interoperable exercises, because that's how you're really going to fight. Wars aren't fought uh, by just in and of yourself by, by individual services. We're fight, we fight as a joint force. So I think we do, uh, I don't know if we need more large exercises. What we need is better quality large exercises that get at very explicit training objectives. In the near term, I'd like to see those training objectives wrapped around experimental training objectives uh, that we can learn as we develop a future force. Over. Thank you, sir. Uh, this question came in from uh, Mr. Ed Kaufman, and he asked, does the uncertainty of the size of future defense budgets factor in here, and into what future priorities are we paying the highest attention uh, are we going to have to pick winners and losers, or are we just going to have to do a better job overall of justifying uh, expenditures against all the other requirements? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a perennial question. Um, now, as we move into the future, it is highly likely, in my view, uh, that we're going to have a flat or even declining uh, Pentagon budget. Now, um, I believe, and I have testified, um, that we need a sustained uh, real growth of the budget of something like 3 to 5 percent. That's exactly uh, the, the, uh, the line that General Dunford took. That's exactly the line that uh, before him, General Dempsey, and so on. That's what all the service chiefs say. That's what all the service secretaries, that's what uh, the various secretaries of defense have said. And that's all true. In order to uh, dig ourselves out of the hole we got into through sequestration and continuing resolutions and so on and so forth, our readiness trough was very significant uh, in all the services. Uh, so we, we suffered a fair amount, uh, and, and there's reasons for it. And there were good reasons why decisions were made the way they were. But in terms of money, we need, roughly speaking, a consistent, uh, predictable, and timely budget that gives us about 3 to 5% real growth. That's what we'll argue for. And it's true, that's what we need. But it's also a reality, a fact, that that is highly unlikely that we're gonna get that. It's just, I don't see that as a realistic thing in the, in the coming years. I see us as being flat or even a downturn in the Pentagon budget. And that's also based on reality of economic facts that are happening to the country. Uh, there, there's, if you, don't have a very, if you don't have a strong economy, you're never gonna have a strong military. And our economy took a significant hit uh, this past year due to COVID and the pandemic. Uh, but in addition to that, we've got to build up the fundamentals and so on. I'm not an economist, but I'm smart enough to know that all of those things are going to hit. Uh, and, and I expect flat or downturn. So the answer to your question is yes, we are going to have to ruthlessly prioritize what it is we're putting money against. So that's a hard thing to do. Uh, when that happens, you start getting people start going into camps and tribes and defending their various budgets. And, and I and others at the level I'm at have got to take a step back and look at the whole. Um, so you're always, you always have a tension uh, between current operations and future operations, between current readiness and future modernization. So that's one priority that you're automatically going to have to deal with right off the bat. 
I will reveal my card right now. I am, you have to be balanced, more or less, but I am biased towards future modernization. The greater challenge for the United States, the longer term, almost existential challenge, is going to be uh, China. It just is. Uh, you, we have to come to grips with that. I'm not saying you're going to have a war with China. Uh, I'm saying we want to prevent a war with China. And we are going to have to uh, invest in the capabilities uh, of the force to prevent that from happening. Uh, there'll be other things that are very much important that are going to put demands on the national budget, uh, education systems, infrastructure, uh, climate change, uh, uh, pandemics, and all kinds of things. But those aren't things that the Department of Defense specifically are required uh, to deal with. But because of those other demands, which are going to be very real, uh, we are likely to have a, 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 a smaller uh, defense budget. And I think the prioritization, in my mind, I would bias towards modernization. That doesn't mean zero for re readiness. Absolutely not. It just means you're biased slightly towards uh, modernization. And then you say, okay, uh, what about you know the, the various forces, the the the, the uh, Navy versus Air Force versus Army versus space, et cetera? Uh, and and I don't want to reveal my cards automatically in that regard, but I probably already did by saying we're a maritime nation. We are, and the defense of the United States depends on air power and sea power primarily. It does. People can say what they want and argue what they want. That's a reality. And I would, I would throw space in there as well. So look at, I'm an army guy and I love the army and we need land power. At the end of the day, people live on the land. And at the end of the day, armies and Marines are decisive in that war involves your imposition of your political will through the use of organized violence over your opponent. And that's gonna happen on the land. And you're not gonna win from afar. It doesn't win, you don't win in the true sense of achieving political decision over your opponent by the use of violence. You're not gonna achieve that through standoff weapons. That's, that ain't going to happen. At the end of the day, you're going to have to close with and destroy. You just have to. That's how, it, that's how it's worked for 10,000 years. I don't see that changing. That's, that's part of the nature of war. That's not going to change. But again, the fundamental defense of the United States and the ability to project power forward, which is one of the American ways of war, and the ability to set conditions for decision that will always be, for America, that's going to be naval and air and space power. And so I would say, and that's, those are also very long lead times for acquisition development. So I would advocate in a bias forward, going forward, for heavy investment in those capabilities. Um, but none of it gets cut to zero. This is a matter of balancing things. It's a very, very difficult exercise. We're going to have to go through it. It's going to be very hard. Uh, it's going to be ruthless. There's going to be a lot of bloodletting and a lot of <clears throat> a lot of stuff left on the on the floor. Uh, but we're going to have to do that in the coming coming years. No question about it. Yes, sir. Thank you. This mess uh, this message this question is from Sam Legrone in USNI News. How does the Army fit into the operating picture in a future Pacific theater that historically has been better suited to other forces like the Navy and the Marines? Clearly, there has to be. Uh, a contribution there and the importance of the Army can't be overlooked. Just wanted to get your insights on that. Yeah, so, you know, my mother and father, my mother was actually okay with me going in the Army, but my dad wasn't. So, um, so I kind of grew up in that environment too, but again, facts matter. So, because both my parents were involved in World War II in the Pacific Theater, um, and a lot of family members and uncles and so on were in the Korean War, and I served in Korea, and I spent time in 25th Division in Hawaii. Um, and, and I've spent a fair amount of time studying the Pacific um, and warfare in the Pacific. Um, and, and on the surface, it sounds like, smells like, looks like a naval theater. And it, you know, if you, you know, you, you can't overlook the obvious, right? We've had a naval officer in charge of uh, Pacific Command or Indo-PACOM, as it's called now, since from Nimitz all the way to Davidson, right? Never been to anybody else but Navy, right? And there's an awful lot of water out there, so it sure makes it, it's common sense. Tells you, oh, that's all Navy. But we should not forget, uh, there were six Marine divisions in the Second World War. All of them were in the Pacific. They all fought generally in the Central Pacific. There were 27 Army divisions that fought uh, in the Pacific. We should remember that from, uh, in, in our nation's history, our largest land wars 
Actually, we're not in Europe. That's one of the myths of our ourselves. The army propagated that myth. So uh, that, but it's not true. The largest land wars the United States ever fought, uh, and the more frequent wars, land wars, have always been in the Pacific. Uh, look, look at the uh, guerrilla war in the Philippines. Look at uh, the Spanish-American War. Uh, a lot of that was fought uh, over there in, in the Philippines. But then, of course, you get into World War II, uh, and then Korea, then Vietnam. Uh, so our largest land wars. Uh, by casualties, by numbers of people, et cetera, were, were not necessarily uh, in other parts of the world, Middle East or Europe. They actually were in the Pacific. Also, take a look at all the various countries of the Pacific, uh, on the Pacific Rim and all of them, and take a look at who leads their militaries, uh, who leads the Chinese military, the Vietnamese military, the Cambodian military, the Philippine military, uh, Australia, and so on and so forth. Just go around the horn, and you start ticking them off, you'll find that most of their militaries are actually led, for better or worse, and I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm just saying they're mostly led by army officers. Thirdly, uh, is in, I would argue, and I argued this four or five years ago as the army chief, and it's still, I think it's still true, the Marines have picked up on it, and I think it's great the Marines have picked up on it, it's the idea of long-range land-based precision fires. That's important. So look at what the Chinese has done to our Navy. They hold our capital ships at risk, they hold our Air Force at risk through a very, very rigorous, robust A2-D2 system of advanced uh, uh, missiles uh, to take uh, aircraft out of the sky uh, or ships off the sea, right? So very, very serious. They can go out for sure to the first island chain, and they can reach out on occasion to the, to the second island chain. And that's only going to increase as we go along. So why should we just cede that space to them? We shouldn't. So I would propose that uh, properly trained, properly outfitted, uh, properly, properly organized and, and equipped uh, land-based units that are on unsinkable aircraft carriers like Luzon or Mindanao or Australia or the coast of Vietnam uh, that have significant range and precision could deny the Chinese uh, at least their surface fleet. It could sink the surface fleet. It could literally deny them the space. Um, and I think they could do that. And then our subfleet, which is unmatched, uh, would just wreak havoc on the opponent's subfleet. So if you take out this air, I won't say it's game over because it's never quite game over, but I got to tell you, that's significant. So I think land-based units, not just Army, but Army and Marines, land-based units that have long-range precision fires, that's an important capability that we ought to seriously look at developing in a very serious way. And when I say long range, I mean serious long range. Uh, and, and, and these units, again, would have to have those other characteristics, small, highly mobile, uh, very survivable, and so on. The other piece is uh, th th there's a high element of protection that is going to be required. Uh, we do have, we are still, I would imagine, going to have to have uh, either air bases or naval bases in the future. We're, we're not going to be completely free of those. There is going to be lines of communication. It is going to be contested. We're going to have to get comfortable being cut off. Um, but we're also going to still have to have that kind of stuff. You're, you're not going to just, it's not going to be just free play out there with no logistics and no lines of communication. Those lines of communication are going to have to be protected. So I would argue that land-based forces play a key role in protection of fixed various fixed sites. Uh, both from land attack or special operations attack, but more importantly, uh, from air attack and missile attack. So I think that the Army and the Marines can provide uh, significant capability, ground capability, in order to protect uh, the forces. The last piece is this joint force idea. At the, at the, as you look at the Pacific, say going across the Central Pacific, the Air Forces, the Army Air Forces, Naval Air Forces, and then the Navy Naval Forces, what they did was they set conditions for amphibious forces to assault and seize the islands. And then the role of the island became an unsinkable aircraft carrier where air forces then would project power forward. Uh, and you would have the naval forces, uh, you know, at a certain point, shortly after Midway, the whole thing becomes uh, dominated by the U.S. Navy. Uh, we had a real struggle in 42 and up, up through Midway, but, but you get the destruction of the Japanese Navy. At some point, sea control is important. I know there's always a debate between sea denial and sea control. Sea control is important. So, you know, rule, rule one is get rid of the enemy. 
uh, whether he's in the air, on the ground, or on the sea, right, or under the sea. So you got to control. You got to get rid of the enemy in order to seize control. So seize control is important early on, but then at at the the next piece of that is denial. You got to deny them the sea so that we can use the sea going forward and advance forces, both land based and naval based uh, air forces and ground forces, in order to achieve a decision. If you're in an actual armed conflict, um, World War the next I shouldn't say. Uh, World War II. World War II and World War I are not necessarily, by the way, um, predictors of what a next great power war would be. Again, I keep defaulting to, I don't want a great power war. I want great power peace. And the way to do that is to deterrence. But if you have a great power war, it is unlikely, very unlikely, it's going to look like a World War II or World War I sort of thing. It's just very unlikely. It'll be much more violent uh, much more casualty producing, much more dynamic. So the idea that you're going to advance linearly across the Pacific from Hawaii to the Central Pacific, and then you're going to seize the Marshall Islands and the Marianas, then you're going to take Iwo Jima and you're going to go to Okinawa and you're going to do this bombing campaign against Japan or in the, uh, next thing, China. I don't see it happening anywhere like that. Uh, I, I just doubt that. Uh, so pre-positioned forces, ground forces, uh, uh, are going to be key. Instead of advancing, like we did in World War II, where Navy sets conditions, advances, bring in uh, air power onto the island, strike deep, bring in the Navy, destroy the Navy's fleet, go to the next island, so on. I, I think in, if, if there was going to be some sort of armed conflict in the future, preposition forces, land forces, uh, will be critical. Uh, and that then gets also back to my first point, which was the long-range uh, precision fires with land-based forces. So there are multiple roles. There's more than that out there. The uh, Navy uh, uh, and Marine team are working with a variety of concepts. Uh, the littoral concepts that the Loki uh, doctrines that are being uh, developed by the Navy and the Marine Corps are very, very important. Um, the Army's working on a whole variety of, uh, of, of projects to do that. But I do think uh, that it would be uh, wrong of us to assume uh, that a war in the Pacific would be a naval and air war. It won't. As I said, it'll be a joint force war that's going to involve all of our services plus those of our allies and partners. Uh, it, it, it's wrong-headed to think any one service is going to, you know, sort of take it on home. It, that won't happen. Sir, thank you. Um, next question is from Hunter Styers at the U.S. Naval War College, and he asks, could you speak to your vision for how the joint force as a whole can counter subkinetic threats like China's maritime insurgency against the freedom of the sea and the rule of international law in the South China Sea? Well, that gets into where we're at now in, in, in uh, the comp great power competition. Uh, we've been in great, ar arguably throughout world history, powers, whether they're great or small, are always in competition. That's the nature of the international environment. Um, so China has certain aspirations. You, you called it a maritime insurgency, and, and that's an interesting way of putting it. But um, this is a, a power that uh, uh, requires, China is, requires a variety of uh, raw materials from overseas, establishing markets overseas. It requires a, a very high demand on uh, petroleum products that they don't produce themselves. So it needs a lot of the oil and and gas uh, uh, energy resources. It needs a lot of rare earth minerals. It needs a lot of uh, things from overseas in order to keep its economy uh, chugging away at a 6% six, 6 growth rate. And, and they're also selling a lot of stuff overseas. China today is the easily the leading manufacturer in the world. <clears throat> so they are dependent upon uh, overseas markets to sell their goods and wares. Um, so in order to do that, they are doing what any other country has done in the past who has those same economic demands. They are establishing for the first time in the history a blue water navy. They're establishing ground and sea lines of communication to distribute their goods and wares around the world and to ensure that they get all the natural resources. Uh, and, and they realize that that's bumping up against uh, U.S. interests that have been in existence for seven and a half decades or more. And therein lies the friction and the problem. How do you deal with that? I would argue that the best way to deal with that is with a robust, rigorous, 
realistic diplomatic approach uh, to uh, a rising China, uh, and it's backed up with a very significant, real, uh, capable military that does things like freedom of navigation on a frequent basis, that has capabilities in the gray zone, that does not act in a passive way, but acts in an assertive but peaceful way, so that you don't get an inadvertent incident that then sparks you put you on an escalation ladder that sparks a larger conflict. Uh, and there's there's a lot more to that answer. Um, and I'd have to spend an hour or two with you to explain some of the things we're we're looking at and doing right now uh, with respect to China. It's very problematic, but the fact that you're even thinking about it is exactly right uh, because that's the kind of thinking we're going to have to have very serious thinking over the next ten years or so in order to keep us a great power competition. Pete, I got about five minutes left, so I can take two more questions. Okay, sir. Uh, there's been a discussion, um, kind of follows in parallel with uh, force structure discussions that uh, you've been so intimately involved with and have mentioned uh, in your remarks. But uh, one of the things that comes up often is this idea of, you know, do we need forward presence or should we do it all from home with a high-end force that benefits by being together and training together to a high end and a high level of readiness? And there's a yin and yang there. And some people see it as an or gate. Um, I've always seen it as an and gate and wanted to see what your thoughts were on that forward presence versus do it from home. Yeah, I, I, in, in some ways, I think it's a bit of a false argument, uh, the way it's framed by a lot of folks in different uh, venues. Here's my view is the, the first thing we have to answer, and it's not a military, uh, it's not a military responsibility to answer it. Um, it's, it's what's the role of America in the world sort of thing, right? And, and it's a grand sort of strategic uh, question that has to be asked and answered, not by those of us in uniform. Uh, we're an instrument of power that carries out various policies. It has to be answered, asked and answered uh, by the nation's policymakers, the American people, the Congress, and so on and so forth. Right now, uh, we have a role in the world that is derivative of what we had at the tail end of World War II. And, and that is uh, uh, the, the power that is the security guarantor no. of the rules-based uh, international order that was put in place in 1944-45 at the tail end of the war. Uh, so long as that is still our self-defined role in the, in the world, uh, then we're going to have to have a significant military that is uh, present forward. Now, present forward doesn't mean based forward, in my view. So that means that you could have the military, the U.S. military could be forward on a rotational basis. Uh, it could be episodic. Uh, it, th there's a lot of different ways to get there. Uh, so the, one of the keys, though, are the bases forward. I am not a fan of large, permanent military bases from the U.S. overseas and other people's countries. Uh, I, I think that is something that needs a hard, hard look. Much of that is a derivative of where World War II ended. And, and some of those bases are, in fact, uh, you know, the, the front line trace of where we were at the end of the war. So, um, and, and, and all the things that developed during the Cold War. Large, permanent U.S. bases overseas are, might be necessary for rotational forces to go into and out of, but permanently positioning U.S. forces, I think, needs a significant relook in for, for the future for a lot of reasons. One is cost, but another is force protection, uh, especially for our non-combatants, family members, spouses, children, et cetera. Now, we have all, many of us have served overseas, et cetera, uh, in a variety of capacities, uh, other than combat zones. Um, and, and it's, you know, people like it and they're overseas and it's exciting. You're in a foreign country and speaking a language and all this other kind of stuff. But there are elements of risk. So, for example, uh, we have a fair amount of noncombatants in Bahrain, Fifth Fleet. Well, there's a variety of tension and has been for quite some time with Iran. If we were ever to have a conflict with Iran, those noncombatants would be at high risk. We have a lot of non-combatants stationed permanently, or at least on a PCS move, to South Korea. 
um, and that's always been a, a, a difficult challenge for uh, many, many decades now is the situation with North Korea. If something were to happen, then we would have a significant amount of non-combatant U.S. military personnel uh, or U.S. military dependents in harm's way. Um, so I have a problem with that. Uh, I don't have a problem with us, those of us in uniform, being in harm's way. This is what we get paid for. This is what our job is, right? Uh, so putting us forward on, our, on a rotational basis, I think, is a smart strategic choice. But taking a hard look at our permanent overseas infrastructure, which includes families overseas, I think it's time we take a hard look at that. I think we have uh, too much infrastructure overseas uh, and too much permanent infrastructure. Um, for some allies and partners, that's an insurance measure that, that makes them feel good, that we're there on a permanent basis and we have families there, et cetera. <clears throat> but I think from a strategic standpoint and an operational standpoint, I'm not so sure that that is a smart move going into the future. It may have been at one time, but I think rotational forces, forward presence for sure, I, I have no problem with forward presence, but I think it should be selective, more selective than what we are, uh, and it should be it should be explicitly designed to achieve a strategic purpose uh, relative to the goals and the reality of the world that we see coming. So I do think that needs a, a relook. That would be a major muscle movement for the Department of Defense. And frankly, there's not a lot of enthusiasm to do what I just said, but I do think that's necessary. General, you've uh, been very generous with your time today. You, we've used the time you promised us and then some. So I would just like to stop here and thank you again for sharing your perspective with us uh, and your time with us uh, and for all the audience that's here with us today. We know your time is precious. We thank you for what you do and root for your success every day. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate it and, uh, and appreciate uh, what your audience does every day in defense of our great country. So thank you. Sir. This concludes our 2020 Defense Forum Washington program. And I would like to thank all of our speakers, attendees, and our conference sponsors, Lockheed Martin and Leonardo DRS. And we look forward to seeing you at our 2021 program and other Naval Institute events. Thank you very much out here.